Welcome everyone to my first part of my State of the Civilizations 2022 series! As we bring in the new year, I thought it would be an excellent opportunity to take stock of the 39 civilizations currently in AoE2 DE and see where they are right now in terms of both design and balance. Then, for the sake of comparison, we're going to rank the civs by placing them in a tier list. Now, the point of these videos is not to say, oh, these are the strongest or weakest civs in the game right now. The primary focus here is on the design of the civilizations themselves and how they fit into the game. Essentially, we're going to consider how unique a civilization is, how well its bonuses and unique units fit into the overall design space in AoE 2, and yes, how balanced that civ is between the various game and map types that we play. In general, a well-designed civilization is strong in some areas and weak in others, but not to the point of being a one-trick pony. Therefore, a civilization can be really strong in the current meta on certain maps, but still face major design issues. Now, obviously, these are all just my opinions regarding Civ design, so please let me know in the comments as to what you guys think about these civs these days. Also, just like my campaign tier list series, these videos take a long time to make, so please be sure to leave a like if you are hyped for them. Now, with our objective in this series established, let's briefly go through the different tiers in this tier list. Again, this tier list is not saying, oh hey, this civ is stronger than the other, but rather serves as just a visual guide and reference point, as well as to help keep track of the over three dozen civs in the game right now. That said, here is my tier breakdown. At at the top we have what I will call complete. These are what I consider to be the best design civs in the game right now. A complete civ possesses very distinct strengths and weaknesses, and yet still feels unique and powerful overall. These are the only civs that I believe don't need any changes, or if they do, they are simply very, very minor tweaks. One step down, we'll have what I call almost there. These civs are, well, almost there when it comes to balance and design, but they do need some small tweaks. This could be something like a bonus that feels weird, or a unique tech, or just some aspect of their tech tree or really anything like that. Next are the something is off civs, who are either going to have more problem areas than the almost there civs, or the issues are less easily identifiable or fixable. Here we see civs that likely need something like a new bonus or unique unit rework. This could also cover civs that simply have more than one or two problem areas. Falling further down, there are the somewhat problematic civs. These civs are going to have a generally cohesive identity and or decent balance, but there is just something pretty deeply rooted that prevents them from feeling complete. Complete. It's at this point that myself, other content creators, top players, and the community at large are all going to have very different solutions on how to solve these perceived issues. An important thing to note is that a vast majority of civilizations are in this tier or higher, which indicates that AoE2 is in a pretty good spot overall. That said, nearing the bottom we have the few major changes needed civs. These civilizations may have some sort of identity, and they may even be decent or even strong picks in certain settings, but for whatever reason, they just don't work. These civs are going to be the awkward and situational ones that you'll not like randoming on the ladder. Last, and unfortunately least, we have the one civ that I feel needs a more or less complete overhaul. If you haven't figured it out already, I won't spoil it now, but I'll just talk more in depth about that civ once we get to it. Okay, so now that we have all of this setup done, it's finally time to break down the civs. Note that this is going to be a three-part series with each video having 13 civs going in alphabetical order. As with almost all of my tier list videos, Aztecs are the lucky ducks that get to go first. Will the Aztec privilege continue with me immediately placing them into the top tier? Yep, pretty much. Aztecs will indeed start us off strong with a complete tier designation. It is true that Aztecs are perhaps the strongest civilization on the 1v1 Arabia setting, and this may make them feel totally overpowered, but AoE2 is more than just that setting. First, I'm going to talk about the Aztecs' identity, which really answers the questions of how unique is this civ compared to all of the others in the game, does it have interesting and easily identifiable aspects, and does it fit within the core design space of the game? AKA, does the Civ feel gimmicky? And to answer those questions, yes, I believe Aztecs do all of that. The obvious point of comparison here is between the three American Civs. Looking at Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas, our first Civ here clearly focuses on having the strongest eco, monks, and individual units. The awesome thing with this Civ, and honestly why they're so strong, is that the Aztec army is just so powerful and expensive, but their fantastic eco helps keep up with that production. You get arguably the best monks in the game with the extra HP, and their infantry can boast some of the highest attack. And then, to top it all off, Aztecs even have the best Siege Workshop of the American Civs, 
being the only one with access to siege onagers. But of course that brings us to the downsides of the Aztecs. All of their best units are very fragile, and they are in contention with the Turks for being the most gold-reliant civ in the entire game. Yes, I know Aztec monks are extra tanky, but the monk as a unit is still fundamentally slow and unarmored. The civ also possesses one of the worst navies in the entire game, missing the galleon upgrade, and their farming-centric eco bonus with the extra carry capacity really hurts them on hybrid maps where you want to be fishing. Additionally, like the other American American civs, the Aztecs possess no gunpowder or cavalry, but unlike Mayans and Incas, Aztecs also miss access to the fully upgraded Arbalest. Missing strong archers and cavalry of any kind really do hamper them in any sort of team game setting, where they can really only shine on closed maps. Speaking of which, when it comes to balance, yes the Aztecs are undoubtedly one of, if not the best 1v1 Arabia civ in the game. They are also powerful in maps like Arena, Hideout, and Black Forest. In my opinion, when it comes to Arabia, the things that could potentially potentially push Aztecs over the top would be their ability to lame, and then the Eagle Warrior as a combat unit in general. However, I would divorce those possible issues from the Aztecs themselves, as the same is also applicable to Mayans and Incas. Actually, Mongols, Vietnamese, and then to some extent Goths and Berbers are also pretty frustrating to deal with in the laming department. Nevertheless, the Civ is far from unbeatable, and recent buffs to Swordsmen and Light Cavalry also indirectly nerf Eagles and Monks. So all in all, the Aztecs just work well as a Civ in AoE 2. Their bonuses are all useful, the Jaguar Warrior is situational but a powerful option, especially after some recent buffs, and then Atlatl, Garland Wars are both fantastic unique techs. Say what you want about Aztecs, man, but they are just one of the most standout and iconic civilizations in the entire game. Second up will be the Berbers, who, despite possessing a fairly decent spread of good maps and game types, will find themselves in the something is off tier. In general, Berbers are a good example of a Civ that is fairly well balanced, but suffer from some noticeable design issues. But before I dive into what I believe those issues are, let's just take a moment to consider what the Berbers' identity even is as a Civ in AoE 2. The tech tree describes them as a cavalry and naval civilization, but I'll take it a step further and would argue that Berbers are a cavalry slash camel sieve that focuses mostly on cost-efficient armies and a broad tech tree, but coming at the expense of any real eco bonus. We can see this most clearly in the defining bonus of the civilization, and that is the Berber stable unit discount, which naturally lends itself to producing larger amounts of already well-upgraded scouts, knights, and camels. The well-upgraded part I feel is especially relevant here, because although you do miss the big important paladin upgrade, everything else about your army is quite fleshed out. Similarly, Berbers are clearly focused as a mid-late game Civ, with the early game economy and military being the next best thing to generic. This contrasts them with the many other cavalry civs in the game that all possess better scout rushes. Berbers don't really do that. They want to get to Castle Age ASAP, but from mid-game onwards the civ really comes online with its cheap cavalry and broad tech tree, importantly possessing the powerful late game unit in the Camel Archer. For those reasons I would say that the core identity of Berbers is totally there, being a cavalry camel focused civ that prioritizes mid to late game unit and cost efficiency over early game economic and military strength. Of course, with that in mind, now we need to talk about why the Civ feels off, as I say. Although many of the Civ bonuses and tech tree feel quite distinct with the Berbers, they also have some very real, messy spots. And as everyone knows, where you find a mess, you also tend to find a janitor. Or genitor. Yeah, this unit just feels so strange in its implementation. But even just beyond how the genitor plays out, because I still believe it's actually underutilized by top players, the way it even exists as a team bonus is just so strange. I'll say the same thing with the Vietnamese imp skirms later, but I simply don't like team bonus units as they feel so random and difficult to balance, with the exception being the Italian Condottiero, because that unit is literally a mercenary. But for the Genitor, the fundamental issue is that in team games, you don't want to be making skirmishers in almost all situations. You have the potential for trade, and your enemies typically have some sort of cavalry or siege, making skirmishers a pretty lousy option most of the time. When it comes to what I would do to tidy up the messy part of Berbers, I would simply have the effect of Kazbah be their team bonus, since the tech kind of feels like it should be a team bonus anyway, but then keep the Genitors as a unique unit. Then perhaps the unit could get a small buff if it's needed. It's true that there would need to be a new Castle Age unique tech, but there could be any number of smaller effects that could be implemented. Ultimately, the Berbers feel like a sieve that are generally cohesive in terms of both balance and design, but the implementation of the Genitor unit really does make the sieve feel like something is off. We next move on to one of our two newest sibs from the Dawn of the Dukes expansion, the Bohemians, and they will be joining the Berbers in the Something is Off tier. To be honest, for a sib that is still quite new, that is not at all a bad placement. 
The game classifies the Bohemians as a gunpowder and monk civilization, which is a designation that is only shared between them and the Spanish, and is overall, I'd say, an accurate assessment for the civilization. Now, as more civs are added to the game, it becomes more difficult to create new and unique civilization identities. I mean, there are only so many unique bonuses and niches that can be filled within the design constraints of AoE2. That said, Bohemians do feel like they fit into the AoE2 roster pretty nicely. Yes, there are several civs that focus on gunpowder and the whole slow, creepy, late-game doom push, as I call them. However, they all go about it in a bit of a different way. Italians have their whole archer and naval thing, Spanish have the cavalry thing, Turks have the whole light cav and cav archer thing, and Portuguese have the… well, we'll get to them later. For Bohemians, we have a sieve that does not shine at all on water maps, but has a ton of strength on closed maps, and is also passable on open maps. The cheap monasteries give them an excellent monk rush, and the trash monks in Imperial Age are quite unique and powerful. The Hofnitsa is an awesome late game unit, which when combined with the early hand cannon potential, creates a really decisive gunpowder identity. With all of that said, there is one major issue that leads the Bohemians to feel off, as I say, and that is the Hussite Wagon. The unit, although pretty fun to play with, just feels so weird in its implementation. First and foremost, we have to talk about the special effect of this unit, which reduces incoming damage to units behind the wagon by 50%. This makes sense logically, since the thing is a big old wooden shield with guns, but in practice it's almost impossible to use effectively. There is no visual indicator as to when a unit is being protected or not, making the effect very impractical, at least to use intentionally. Then you have the fact that the Hussite Wagon is a unit with pretty decent range, meaning that for a unit to be behind it in a fight, it would naturally need to have even longer range. And since the Hussite Wagon is already a strong range support unit, you would usually rather have some sort of meat shield in front of it, most often halberdiers, which then negates the effect entirely. Finally, with the Hussite Wagon, you have the balancing issue where it takes extra bonus damage from mangonels and bombard cannons. This just feels kind of awkward and unintuitive, as those units are already good against siege units, but in this case the Hussite Wagon is taking even more bonus damage, and this is simply from the unit having its own Hussite Wagon armor class. There are several different directions one could take with the unit, but I do feel like some change needs to be made in that regard. Still, overall, the Bohemians are not at all a bad civilization for being introduced so recently. Sure, the Hussite Wagons are awkward, and they are perhaps a bit too strong on closed maps, but by and large, the Bohemians feel fun and unique, with many different ways to play them. And ultimately, that's what you want in a new AoE2 Civ. Moving from one of the newest civs to one of the oldest, most classic civs, we next turn to the Britons, who will be our first almost there entry. As we will see throughout these videos, all of the civs in this tier are seriously, like, almost there, but just have one or maybe two tiny areas that possibly need a small adjustment. Now, speaking to the identity of the Britons, we have no issues here. They are the archetypical foot archer civilization. That's the nice thing with the Age of Kings civs. Since they were the first ones introduced to the game, they all got to set the standards of what an archer sieve, cav sieve, or whatever even looked like. The bonuses that were allocated to the Britons way back in 1999 combined to create one of, if not the most iconic civilizations in all of AoE 2. Of course, their most notable bonus is their extra range for their foot archers, which not only fits the whole longbowman theme, but it also has a ton of interesting gameplay implications. Particularly, because the Brits miss thumbring, their archers need to rely on utilizing that extra range to take good engagements. This is just as true in archer Archer shootouts as it is in fighting hordes of cavalry or infantry. On top of their long-range archers, the Britons also notably possess the strongest booming potential of any archer civ in the game. Their dual eco bonuses of faster working shepherds in the Dark Age, and their cheap TCs from the Castle Age onwards, really help springboard your start in pretty much any map type. Relatedly, Britons are strong on a bunch of different settings, and I would say that they are top tier on closed maps, where their lack of mobility is not much of a problem, as well as a flank in team games. Unfortunately, speaking of team games, we come to why the Britons are not quite at that final complete tier. I have two small issues with this civ, and honestly, they may not even need to be addressed. First, I do feel that balance-wise, Britons are a bit too dominant as a flank in team games. In particular, their team bonus of having faster working archery ranges can be really overbearing when snowballing archers, which is a type of unit that tends to be really snowball-y anyway. However, the plus 20% faster working archery ranges lines up so nicely with the Goth, Hun, and Celt bonuses for the faster working barracks stables and siege workshops respectively, it's a tragic catch-22 of balance and flavor. My other small issue with the Civ is that of their Longbowman unique unit. This is again tricky, because the Longbowman is certainly strong, but not overpowered, and it's also a totally iconic fan-favorite unit. My complaint here is just that the unit's a little bit boring. I mean, it's just a better version of the 
archer line. Yes, I know they're a little bit less accurate, but that's not a big deal. But many unique units are like this. Mangudai, Berserks, Magyar Hussars, etc. The difference between the Longbowmen and those units is that the Longbowmen isn't good against anything that archers aren't already good against, and vice versa. So I feel like there needs to be some small little bit of bonus damage added or something. But still, with all of that said, those critiques are very minor, and like I said, not really areas that necessarily need to be changed. This Civ is just a classic. They're your enemy in William Wallace, your enemy in Joan of Arc, and your enemy in every BF noob only no rush 40 lobby. Alright, next up we have our first last con Civ, the Bulgarians, who will unfortunately find themselves as the first entry in the somewhat problematic tier. I will say that Bulgarians have come quite a long way from where they were at the launch of DE. The Civ is way more powerful and flexible than it used to be, but it still has some rough edges that need cleaning up. So when we think of the identity of Bulgarians, what really comes to mind? It's a bit hard to pinpoint, but my best answer would be that they are the more offensive focused version of the whole infantry cavalry siege archetype that we find throughout Central and Eastern Europe. In my mind, where the whole offensive or I guess military focused aspect comes is the lack of strong eco bonus for the Bulgarians, which is compensated by a slew of military bonuses. I mean, you have free swordsman upgrades, cheaper upgrades at the blacksmith and siege workshop, two incredibly strong unique techs that buff your infantry and cavalry, and even their unique building, the Krepost, is aggressively oriented in the sense that you can place them more cheaply and quickly than castles in the face of your opponent or just take map control in general. Now, this is all well and good, and I do think that the Bulgarians have a nice variety of military bonuses with some clear strengths and weaknesses in their tech tree, but my issue is that there's a little too much overlap with the Slavs. I mean, yes, Bulgarians and Slavs would naturally be very similar, but both civs really excel in the exact same areas militarily. Bad archers, great infantry, strong cavalry, good siege, and they even each have a cavalry unique unit. The only real difference is that Slavs have good monks and access to the crossbowmen, and of course a very good eco bonus, whereas Bulgarians get bracer and thumb ring for cav archers. I don't know, that just doesn't feel like quite enough of a difference to me. The other identity crisis area of the Bulgarians is their unique unit, the Konik. I mean, I get the concept of having a tough cavalry unit that can fight as an infantry when felled, I just don't know what the unit is supposed to do in an actual game. Koniks are very rarely seen, as they do just kind of the exact same thing as knights, but are harder to get going. Compared to the knight line, Koniks are better, although not great, versus pikemen and camels, and are worse versus ranged units. Koniks also have a painfully slow attack speed without the stirrups tech, whereas knights actually have a very fast attack speed. Because of this, I feel that from both a design and balance perspective, the Koenig needs a bit of work done, perhaps even making the cavalry side of the unit weaker and the infantry side of the unit stronger. I'm not sure, but there are definitely options here. So I did just kind of rag on the Bulgarians a fair bit, and not without reason. However, their issues tend to be in the form of overlap with other civs and units, as opposed to being clunky or underpowered in their own right. In a vacuum, the whole Bulgarian identity does make sense, and they are a powerful civ on very aggressive maps, decent on very closed maps, and solid as a team game pocket. That's why the Bulgarians are in the somewhat problematic tier as opposed to anything lower. The Civ does have some obvious issues, but it's not like there needs to be a massive overhaul when it comes to the balance or design. Oh boy, now we get to move on to the first Civ from the controversial DLC, aka Lords of the West. That Civ is of course going to be Burgundians, and of course they will be making Cavalier. It really is that simple. Oh yeah, they're also going into the somewhat problematic tier. Now I will give Burgundians this much credit. Through several patches over the course of this year, the Civ has made massive leaps and bounds when it comes to both design and balance. Like, think back to where Burgundians were at launch and where they are now. Don't you think it's a massive improvement? I would say that their identity as a Civ is very clearly the economy and technology focused Cav Civ. The obvious comparison for Burgundians is the Franks, as both are pretty much the same civilization. However, I would actually say that at this point, the two Civs play very differently. Of course, I'll talk more in depth about the Franks once we get to their section, but for the Burgundians, this Civ is all about economy and technology. You've got the extra income from relics and potentially farms for the economy side of things, the cheaper stable techs with the cavalier available in the castle age for the technology side of things, and then the cheaper eco upgrades that are also available in age earlier which cover both. Again, compared to Franks, Burgundians are a bit lacking in raw unit strength due to their missing of the bloodlines tech, or a comparable HP bonus, and their economy is not quite as quick to get going. However, as the game progresses, their economy will get better and better as their tech advantages can help them hit some very strong timings. Even in post-imp, Burgundians can flex their strong gunpowder. And this comparison is the most obvious with Franks, but to varying degrees it is also applicable to the other cavalry civs in the game. So with all of the praise of 
of the design of the Burgundians, why do they fall into the somewhat problematic tier? Well, yeah, let's just address the war elephant in the room. I do not like Flemish Revolution. At all. Like, this is my single least favorite technology in the entire freaking game. From a design standpoint, I believe that instant unit spawning is a concept that belongs in AoE 3, not in AoE 2. This game is about taking good fights, keeping up with your macro, and smart decisions about what to make and how to react to your opponent, typically leading into small advantages that can snowball throughout the course of the game. Pressing, as I call it, the button, is more of just a knee-jerk reaction kind of thing that's like, hey, here's 140 military units that you have absolutely no way to prevent from spawning. That leads me to the practical in-game issue, and that's how the button just immediately and often anticlimactically ends the game. Yes, I know there are instances where games last well beyond the pressing of the button, but I'd say that it is still pretty far from the norm. Other than the button, I'm just not a fan of the Coustier gimmick with their whole super powerful attack on a 40 second cooldown. It just makes the unit feel very inconsistent in terms of its damage. Again, also feels very un AoE 2 to me. Therefore, despite my earlier praise, Burgundians are still very much hanging out in the somewhat problematic tier. They have made great gains, like I said, as the changing of Burgundian vineyards and their eco bonuses were both excellent calls in my opinion but we still have a ways to go with this civilization. We now turn to another not remotely controversial civilization, the Burmese, who will be our first entry from the Rise of the Rajas expansion. Unfortunately, they will also be our first civ that goes into the major changes needed tier. Yeah, Burmese have always been a bit of a problem child when it comes to both balance and design. Conceptually, the Burmese are identified as an elephant and monk civ, and although that kinda works on some levels, it's not really enough, as both monks and elephants are situational units. And even in looking at that, yes, the Burmese are an excellent monk civ with their discounted techs and their team bonus, but the whole elephant thing is kinda eh. They do get very good elephants once the howda tech comes in, but that's all they have. Furthermore, Burmese are also a civ that is heavily designed around its unique unit, the Arambai. Some civs are more reliant on their unique unit compared to others, and that's okay, but the Arambai has had a bit of a bumpy road. They got a big redesign a little while back where they deal less damage per hit, but their missed shots that incidentally hit some something else deal full damage as opposed to the regular 50%. This did make the unit more unique and more balanced in my opinion, which is good, but it also decreased the raw strength of the Arambai, and left Burmese barely treading water since then. Now this is where design and balance coincide. One of the defining features of the Burmese is their lack of the leather archer armor tech at the blacksmith, aka plus two defense for archers. No other civ in the game misses this tech, so at some level the entirety of Burmese is balanced around this. In practice, missing plus two defense for your archers and and especially skirmishers, gives the Burmese a massive mid-game weakness against strong archer civs. Burmese will perform quite well against melee heavy civs with their strong elephants, monks, and infantry, but the second they go up against a Britons or Ethiopians, well, they're on a one-way trip to Frowntown. In one of the most recent balance updates, the devs restored the Howda tech to its original strength, giving battle elephants a whopping 9 pierce armor. That means that you can just use their elephants versus archers, right? Well, no, because elephants are still slow and expensive and require that unique tech to even be researched in the first place to be getting anywhere. So yes, Burmese elephants are fantastic versus archer civs in post-imp, but the civ fundamentally lacks any real way of dealing with strong archers from castle age through mid-imperial age. So this extreme weakness to archer civilizations is at the crux of the Burmese design challenge. It's really difficult to balance because you want Burmese to be weaker against archer civs, but right now they really have no chance in many situations. That's why they're going into the major changes needed tier. The basic framework of the Burmese is there, so I do think they're saved from the bottom tier, but their balance issues are just so deeply rooted that it will take some pretty major changes to solve. On a more positive note, we return to one of the original 13 Age of Kings civilizations with the fan favorite Byzantines. What I love about this civ is that over the course of the past year or so of patches, Byzantines got these tiny, well-targeted buffs that, in my opinion, launched the civilization right up to the complete tier. When it comes to identity, I don't think there is any question that Byzantines are the defensive jack-of-all-trades civilization. In fact, until DE came out, the Byzantines were the only civ to even have the defensive label in the tech tree. As to why this is the case, well, you have the extra building HP, free building line of sight techs, faster healing monks, and of course the cheaper counter units. That's a lot of defensively oriented bonuses right there. Beyond that, this civilization has the single broadest tech tree in the entire game, and it can therefore tailor their army composition to deal with whatever their opponent throws at them. To balance this, they do miss some very important upgrades like Bloodlines, Blast Furnace, and Siege Engineers, which means their units tend to be cheaper and weaker than those of their opponents. Still, importantly, Byzantines do get access to one power unit in the Cataphract. 
Being an anti-infantry heavy cavalry that can deal trample damage, the Cataphract has always been popular, but it's also been historically really hard to get to in a regular game. Thankfully, a few patches ago, the elite upgrade cost got reduced for the unit, making it much more viable in 1v1s. On the balance side of things, Byzantines are at least decent in pretty much every single map type and in game mode. However, they do have a few situations in which they are top tier, which is very important. If a Civ is just kinda pretty good everywhere, no one is gonna want to play them, as there will always be several civs that are more appealing. Thankfully, Byzantines are certainly a high tier pick on arena and on water maps. Like I said, they are at least decent everywhere, but I would say they especially excel in those situations. Now, although this section is mostly just rainbows and sunshine, there is one tiny issue I have with the Byzantines, and that is how the Greek fire unique tech makes fireships pretty inaccurate at that extra one range, which seems kind of needless. However, that detail is so minor that the Byzantines still comfortably reside in the complete tier. Not really much else to say, and that's the nice thing with these complete civs. Their sections get to be nice and short. Continuing along the nostalgia train of Age of Kings civs, we turn to the very first civilization most players experienced, and that is the Celts. Particularly on the back of the recent buff to the Castle Age Woad Raider, William Wallace and company will find themselves comfortably slotting into the almost there tier. Alright, so I think the Celtic identity is pretty clear. They are the original infantry plus siege civ, and notably, compared to a civ like, say, Teutons, Celts really don't have good cavalry or ranged options. These guys are all about the speedy infantry and strong siege, backed by an incredibly consistent eco bonus in their 15% faster working lumberjacks. As I mentioned, their archery ranged options are truly terrible, and their stable leaves much to be desired. To make matters worse, they don't even have gunpowder to really help round out their tech tree. But the awesome thing with Celts is that just doesn't really matter. Their eco and siege is good enough to carry them through the early to mid game, ideally setting up the Celt player for that inevitable infantry switch as they work toward the Imperial Age. Of course, that's where the historical weakness of the Civ comes in. Celts have one of the very worst late Castle Age, early Imperial Ages in the entire game. It's all about weathering the storm as you get your late game infantry and siege machine rolling, but it can be very difficult to hold off against a lot of Civs that have strong timing attacks. However, a really nice note here is the recent buff to Castle Age Woad Raiders, with their extra two attack making them a much more viable option before post imp. When it comes to balance, Celts have always just been one of those solid civilizations that hasn't needed many changes. Although they don't really excel on open maps and team games, and definitely not on full water maps, Celts are at least decent in most other settings. Of course, I have to mention the popularity of Hoang and his very distinct style of early Castle Age aggression with this Civ on open maps. And that is certainly a viable strategy, but you can also take a more economically oriented approach. Of course, where Celts have always dominated is on Black Forest team games, where their deadly infantry plus siege combo is always really tough to deal with. So with all of this praise for the Celts, why do I not think that they are a complete Civ? Well, the answer is an easy and obvious one, and that is their Castle Age unique tech, Stronghold. Making castles and towers fire faster may be decent in theory, but in practice, uh, Celts don't really have great defenses anyway. They miss Bracer for their keeps and castles, and just generally rely on brute strength as opposed to careful defense. So then, what do we do with the Stronghold tech? I honestly have no idea. This might be one of those situations where we need to scrap the tech and replace it with something more useful being careful, of course, to not break the Civ. Nevertheless, Celts remain a fan-favorite Civ and very much fill the classic infantry and siege role. Their Woad Raiders are awesome, as are their Siege Onagers. You've always got to be on the lookout for some hungry mangoes when facing Celts, because they will eat your TCs. We just keep on rolling with these Age of Kings civilizations, as our next entry is going to be the Chinese. Now, although Chinese are undoubtedly a very powerful civilization in a ton of situations, I do believe they possess notable weaknesses, have a clear and unique design, and honestly I don't think they need any changes. So we're putting them in the complete tier. Speaking of unique design, for myself and I believe most players, the first thing that comes to mind with Chinese is their start. Opening the game with double the standard villagers, but at the cost of all of your food and a quarter of your wood, makes things interesting to say the least. I will say that a big factor in this rise in success of Chinese over the past four-ish years has really been the increased consistency in map generations, as well as them gaining the old Teuton bonus of extra TC line of sight. I'm sure many of you remember back in Age of Conquerors, where every single time you played this civilization, your sheep were always halfway across the map and in the last place you scouted. Ah, good times. Anyway, when you get off to a good start with Chinese, you can then bring your two other eco bonuses into play, your progressively cheaper technologies and the extra food you get on your farms via your team bonus. These combine to give Chinese one of the most powerful economies in the game, and honestly, I would consider Chinese to be more of an economy.
economy civilization, then I would think of them as an archer civ. Of course, their other most notable aspect is their broad tech tree, which fits in really well with their cheaper technologies. What is especially notable here is that Chinese get a near-perfect archery range, barracks, and stable, but they also have an ace up their metaphorical sleeve with their iconic Chukonu unique unit. Yes, the Chukonu is cool in that it rapid fires several bolts in quick succession, but when you look at the unit's role in the game, it is just the sheer damage per second foot archer, with the Mangadai being the equivalent for cav archers. Chukes just shred stuff, man, and that raw power is something that the Chinese lack otherwise, which just makes the Civ that much more cohesive. Now, talking about balance, I know there are gonna be some of you watching that think Chinese are OP on your kind of generic land map, especially if there are any top players watching. And yes, as I was talking about, the standardization of random map scripts and the general increase in skill level of AoE2 players does lead to Chinese being one of the top civilizations on many different land maps, not just Arabia. However, especially post-wall nerfs, it's just really hard to not die in early feudal age, and that has always been a critical weakness of the Chinese. I've seen top players try to go for pre-milled rushes and fast minute arm rushes with this Civ on Arabia many times. It very rarely ends well. On top of that, Chinese are now pretty terrible on any kind of nomad start map because you don't get your extra villagers until your first town center is completed, so you can't build it any faster than normal. And the Civ was almost always the very last Civ to be drafted in the most recent 4v4 Black Forest tournament. Therefore, in the end, I would say that yes, Chinese are a very powerful Civ, but they are also a dynamic one, featuring a fairly high skill floor and distinct strengths and weaknesses. They hate siege onagers just as much as Celts love them. But of course, if you're able to handle their tricky opening, Chinese will almost always serve you well in any game mode. Finally, bucking the trend of Age of Kings civs, our third to last contestant today is the Cumans, who hail from the Last Khans DLC. This civilization has been on an absolutely wild ride when it comes to balance and design, and unfortunately there is still plenty of work to do, landing the Cumans in the major changes needed tier. So in general, the core identity of the Cumans does actually make sense. Obviously they are a steppe nomad civ, but they've got a few interesting and unique characteristics. On the one hand, compared to Tatars and Mongols, they are the closest to the Europeans, and we see this reflected by their access to paladins and fully upgraded halberdiers. However, they're also the least cav archer e, with the lack of bracer being one of the defining characteristics of the Cumans. Additionally, the Cumans lacked a sort of centralized empire, which is reflected in-game with their absolutely potato defenses. Of course, in-game, Cumans are known for their super feudal age. Their defining eco bonus is their ability to build a second town center in feudal, giving them the potential for one of the strongest economies in the entire game. They can also make feudal age rams and castle age capped rams, which certainly fits the whole theme we're working with here. Their unique unit, the Kipchak, is interesting in that it's kind of a weak cav archer, but with the caveat of being very fast and nimble. The unit has a very short frame delay, making it easy to micro, and their extra arrows can help a bunch in dealing with enemy siege units. Unfortunately, this is where the nice things to say about humans comes to an end. Despite getting some sort of guaranteed value with the recently added discount to archery ranges and stables, so much of the human civilization is so conditional. If you can't build a second town center in feudal age, then you have no eco bonus, which creates this massive inconsistency where, depending on the map and game state, humans can have one of the worst or one of the best economies in the game. It also limits the Civ's strategic variety, as you're forced into going for a very specific game plan if you want to get the most out of the Civ. It's honestly one of my least favorite eco bonuses in the entire game, and one that could really use a big rework. The other really sticky area with humans is their Imperial Age unique tech, the very creatively named Cuman Mercenaries. Again, I get the idea of what they were going for with this tech, as the Cumans did indeed historically serve in many different militaries as mercenaries, but just as an AOE2 tech, it doesn't really work. I will say this every time it crops up. I do not like single-use technologies in AOE2. Everything should have some sort of permanent, positive effect. In this case, everybody on your team gets their 10 free Kipchaks, and then that's it. And most of the time, your teammates won't even want the Kipchaks since they'd have terrible upgrades for them and it wouldn't fit into their army composition. The tech is also more expensive than the collective cost of 10 Kipchaks, making it completely useless in 1v1s. Yeah, just not a good tech. Briefly considering the balance of the Civ, it's honestly not too bad. They are always going to have deadly potential with their economy on closed maps, particularly on Regicide Fortress, and their cheaper ranges and stables do give them some options on open maps as well. Overall, the humans still feel like such a clunky civilization, and although the basic framework of a unique identity is here, we still need to see many changes before they can feel complete. Moving on to lighter matters, our penultimate Civ of the video will be the second African Kingdom's entry with the Ethiopians. Overall, a solid civilization in terms of both design and balance, I believe a middle-of-the-pack rating of something is off to be totally applicable here. Starting, of course, with the identity, 
and design of the Civ, Ethiopians are going to be AoE2's glass cannon civilization. Between faster firing archers, high damage shotel warriors, and extra blast damage siege weapons, Ethiopians find themselves with a ton of toys that will kill stuff really quickly, but also cost a lot and die really quickly. Of course, they are classified as an archer civ, with the aforementioned faster reload time being the main selling point in that area. I mean, yeah, it's their only archer bonus, but it's such a good one that they don't need anything else to hang up there with the Britons and Mayans of the world. This does come at a cost though, as Ethiopians also have the weakest economy of all of the game's archer civs. You do get your plus 100 food and gold upon reaching the next age, which can lead to some nifty fast feudal and fast castle strategies, but that's really all you have going for your economy. Freak Pikeman is nice for sure, but it's not any kind of permanent bonus that will help you throughout a game. And this is where we kind of run into a few issues with Ethiopians. Yes, they are a solid civ, but it does feel like they have something missing. Their team bonus is kind of weird and out of place, and the Shotel Warrior is fun, but it's also a very situational unit. Also, in my opinion, you need to be very careful with a unique tech that will only benefit the unique unit, as it runs the risk of just being really boring. Royal Heirs is no exception here. It makes an already super fast training unit train even faster. At least a tech like Logistica makes the Cataphract function in a slightly different way. This all leaves Ethiopians with a somewhat inflexible army composition, as their cavalry is bad, their economy is mediocre, and you don't even get a siege bonus until you get torsion engines in post imp. Maybe another small bonus to their siege units could help out the Civ. It would better show off their unique characteristic of being the only Civ in the game with a complete siege workshop tech tree, and it might give them something that's a bit more exciting in mid castle age other than just archers. But that's just me thinking off the top of my head. When it comes to in game balance, again, Ethiopians are a fine civilization, but they never really excel on any given game mode or map type, except Empire Wars, but that honestly feels more like an exploit than an intentional effect, but I digress. They are above average on Arabia, Arena, Black Forest, and below average on any sort of water map. That's great, but they never really break into the top five or even bottom five civs anywhere. An exception might be open map team games where they barely eke into top five as a flank and bottom five as a pocket, but that's really it. It's kind of like what I was saying about Byzantines. Even if a civ is decent in most areas, they should really have some sort of common setting in which they excel. And that's I think a good way to wrap up the Ethiopians. They aren't at all a bad civ. They do have a pretty unique identity, and they're pretty fun to play. It just feels like, well, something is off. And last, but certainly not least, our final Civ of the day will be the single most popular one in the entire game, the Age of Kings classic, The Franks. Now, despite whatever complaints you may find on Reddit or on the official forums, I do believe that Franks are actually quite a well-balanced and designed civilization and comfortably fall into the complete tier. As far as design goes, Franks complete the trio of the original Western European Civs that all featured in the first two campaigns back in Age of Kings. Britons were the Archer Civ, Celts were the Infantry and Siege Civ, and Franks rounded out the crew as the Cavalry Civ, and to a lesser extent Gunpowder. Naturally, Franks have arguably the best Paladins in the game with their plus 20% HP Cavalry bonus. On top of that, the Chivalry Unique tech allows you to churn out those bad boys in the late game like crazy, and also boosts the research speed of those very slow techs. Of course, Cavalry is expensive, and Franks get solid Eco bonuses to help get them where they need to be. The faster working Forgers in Dark Age is a solid bonus, as are the free farm upgrades from Feudal Age onwards. Beyond Beyond their eco and cavalry, Franks also possess one of the strongest map control bonuses in the game with their 25% cheaper castles. Of course, it's not like Franks can just make cavalry, as they also boast some fairly powerful infantry options. A complete barracks tech tree is always great, and their throwing axemen unique unit, or as Debbie would call them, axe throwing thingies, give them an excellent option against pikemen and really just trash units in general. The only thing I'm kind of eh about with Franks is their unique tech bearded axe. Like I just said, I'm not usually the biggest fan of unique techs that only benefit fit a unique unit, so I don't love the tech, but since it actually is a fairly substantial boost to the unit, giving taxmen between plus 33% and plus 25% more range, I can at least live with it. Now, when we're talking about balance, yes, this is the part where I have to say that Franks usually have the best win rate of any civilization on the ladder. However, and this is important, that fact does not necessarily mean that the civilization is overpowered. In my opinion, this high win rate has two important factors to consider. First, Franks are one of the most straightforward civilizations to play in the entire game. I'm not going to say that they are easy, but the whole scouts into knights into castle drop into GG easy game plan is very streamlined. This makes Franks a very consistent performer on ladder at all levels of play, but especially at lower levels when players are not experienced enough to deal with the more tricky civs in AoE 2. That's just a fact of Franks, and that's okay. 
Two, ladder win rates are massively weighted towards Arabia, and to a much lesser extent Arena. As it turns out, Franks are a really good sieve on Arabia and other open maps, so having the most games played on those map types naturally make a sieve look good. Of course, Franks are decent on most maps, with the obvious exception being water maps, but this is still a relevant factor. So overall, Franks are just a comfort sieve for a lot of players. You know what you're good at, and you know how to get there in most situations. They will always excel as a pocket sieve in team games because they are so streamlined towards cavalry play, but like I said, all of this is okay. If you want to try hard on ladder and really improve your AoE2 fundamentals, all I can say is bon chance. And with that, we are now officially one third of the way through the sieves in Age of Empires 2, meaning we have reached the end of this video. This discussion is definitely theory crafting heavy, so please let me know what you guys think of the sieves we discussed today in the comments section. Of course, be sure to leave a like if you found this fun and or educational, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss part two of this series, which will come out when it comes out. Lastly, as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.